Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential symphonic poems for beginners. Now, what, you may well ask, is a symphonic poem? Well, that's really easy. It's just a piece of orchestral music that describes something. It could be anything. It could be a story. It could be a play. It could be something that the composer dreamed up, you know, all by his or herself. It doesn't make any difference. As long as it's about something, it's a symphonic poem. It may be very concrete. It could be a train. It could be a journey. It could be something very philosophical. And we're going to talk about a little of all of those things. But the terminology is very loose. Symphonic poems, technically, were invented by Liszt in the 1850s or 60s. He wrote 12 of them. And his theory of the symphonic poem was that it was a work in which a certain number of basic themes or a main theme is transformed to, to represent different states of mind or emotional expression throughout the work, following the story or whatever it is that he's trying to illustrate. But they existed way before Liszt got his hands on them. They were just called something else. They were called concert overtures. I mean, a concert overture is a freestanding piece of music, usually in one movement, which is, describes something. And it could be a play. It could be, for example, you know, Mendelssohn wrote an overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is actually not in my list. But I'm mentioning it now because it's a great example. It describes the play. It takes its ideas from the characters in the play, its moods, its everything about it, its orchestration, the themes are based on his idea of how to represent the characters in the play. So it's a symphonic poem. Richard Strauss, after Liszt, called his versions tone poems, and they became very long. They could be as long as a symphony and have many sections. Sometimes you could have several movements. They became absolutely indistinguishable from a symphony, other than the fact that they told a specific story, rather than simply being an abstract expression of emotional states or contrasting feelings. That's the difference, but it's a very, very loose distinction. And so, and so you, you don't really need to worry about, you know, what's a symphonic poem and what isn't and what's an overture and what's a thing. In the 19th century, it made a huge difference because there was a huge argument between Liszt and Wagner, who were part of the progressive school of German orchestral music, instrumental music, and Brahms, who was the more conservative, supposedly. Now, those labels are very, very relativistic. But the fact is that Brahms symphonies aren't about anything other than the feelings that they express, whereas Liszt's tone poems are about something, things from literature, all kinds of subjects and poems and things that he tried to illustrate in music. And that was the difference between the two. And there was a huge war between partisans on both sides about which one was better and which one was more, more legitimate and which one was the logical expression of musical progress and all of those things, none of which make a bit of difference to us now. I mean, there are remnants of that controversy still percolating through the musical world. And you may detect them now and again in the way people describe and discuss some of these pieces. People who think that, you know, Brahms was conservative and didn't know how to orchestrate, or people who think that Liszt was like screechy and vulgar. I mean, these, these categorizations still exist. But in terms of their, their real meaning musically, it's all nonsense because, you know, what matters is what you like and what we want to listen to. So I have put together a list of 10 fabulous symphonic poems. I'm using the term broadly to encompass everything here. And we're just going to go through them one at a time. And this is really fun stuff. I mean, people like music that describes things, especially if they tell you in advance what it is that it's describing, because it allows you to focus your attention on what the music's doing and make those connections. Music itself, you know, is actually rather limited in what it can express in concrete terms. You know, if you want to do something, well, we'll talk, let's talk about the pieces and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go, shall we? First, Beethoven, the Leonora Overture number three. Yeah, there are three Leonora Overtures. Actually, there's more than that because all of them were written for his single opera, Fidelio, which originally was called Leonora.
Now, the first one that he wrote for the opera was Leonora Overture Number no. 2. It's a huge 15-minute long piece of orchestral mayhem that he jettisoned because he realized that it was about 10 times as dramatic as the first act of the opera. I mean, the opera begins, as some of you may know if you know the story, with a very light, happy, almost musical comedy sort of story of a love interest between a woman dressed as a man and the jailer's daughter. What she's really there to do is rescue her husband, who's a political prisoner, and that gets really hot and heavy in the second act. But the first act, everything is sort of light and bucolic, and Beethoven wrote this massive overture that just sort of blew it away. So he said, nah, that's not right. Then he had the opportunity to do um, a, a production that never materialized, actually. It was going to be in Prague or someplace like that. So he wrote another overture, but it never got used. It was only discovered after he died, and so that, wasn't, that was number one, actually, because they all got misnumbered. The numbering got all mangled. And then he wrote number three. And then he realized, after he wrote number three, that it really was so completely completely self-contained as a piece of music that once again it just blew away the first act of the opera and it really sounded great all by itself so he detached that and that was number three then finally he revised the whole thing and wrote the overture to Fidelio which was the name of Leonora when she was dressed up as a man she you know, her name was Fidelio. So that was the overture that got stuck with the opera. He finally figured out how to do an appropriate overture to the opera. And so we have these three Leonora overtures that are played separately as standalone works. And the third is unquestionably a tone poem. It describes in, in a general sense the action of the opera. And those, those, those actions, those moods are, are, you know, claustrophobic angst tension, suspense, and of course, you know, the, the, the big climactic moment in the opera when Leonora is sitting there with a pistol, you know, held to the head of the, the bad guy, Pizarro, um, and the cavalry arrives in the form of a offstage trumpet announcing that, that the good guys are there and that the bad guys aren't going to win. And Beethoven kept that offstage trumpet in Leonora number three. You will hear it there. And what does it mean? What is there an offstage trumpet playing a fanfare? Why? What is it doing? Well, there's a whole sort of tumultuous section happening there, and things are getting really tense, and all of a sudden you hear the trumpet. And the trumpet is a sign that this is music about something, something from elsewhere. And you can look at the story and read the story, or you can just listen to the music. It doesn't matter which you do, but that trumpet is a dead giveaway. A dead giveaway that we're dealing with symphonic poematude, the land of the of the descriptive piece, rather than a purely abstract bit of musical expression. And then, of course, after the trumpet shows up, we get to hear all the main tunes again, and there's a coda, an unbelievable coda that's just the most exciting thing in the whole world. I mean, the end of this overture is thrilling beyond belief and ends in, in extraordinary heroism and, and, and victory and light and happiness, and it's just marvelous. And you feel like you've really been on a journey. And that's what it's been. It's been a, a journey with events and stuff. So Leonora number three really is a symphonic poem. And you're not going to convince me otherwise, and I'll bet you'll agree when you hear it. Number two, let's move up to Liszt, who invented the technical symphonic poem. Now, like he, I said, he wrote 12 of them. The most famous one is called Les Préludes. Préludes. And it's a completely philosophical symphonic poem. It's not really about anything. It's like life is but a prelude to the great beyond. And the, I, I don't know. No one knows what it's about. People play it the same way they play an overture. And, you know, it moves from darkness to light, much like the Leonora Overture Number no. 3 does. And that's not the one I picked, but you can always listen to it. It's a lovely piece. It really is. It's got a very famous tune in it. Da, 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 dum, bum, 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 ba. You may have heard it before. It was used in lots of movies and things. I chose Mazeppa because Mazeppa is really concrete. 
Mazzi Zeppa tells a story. The story, it's, it's a poem actually by Victor Hugo. And, and the essence of it is that Mazeppa is a courtier at the, at the court of King Casimir of Poland and he has an illicit love affair. So he gets tried and sentenced to be dragged to death by a horse except that the horse dies before he does. And so he survives his dragging and he's rescued by some like Ukrainian Cossacks and he becomes the head Cossack and goes on to lead them to triumph in battle. That's the basic story. Now, how do you express that in music? It's like I said, music can't do certain things. It can only be so concrete. How do you drag a guy by a horse? Well, you can't really in music, but you can do a lot of agitated motion music. And if I say to you, oh, that's the part where he's getting dragged by the horse, you listen to it, you go, aha, of course, that's what it represents. But do you actually know it's the horse? Do you actually know he's got a rope attached to his leg and he's being pulled along? No, of course not. So what Liszt does is basically take two big chunks of this story. One is the dragging, which makes for very, very exciting music, and then perhaps interspersing it with some, you know, as he's being dragged, of course, you know, memories of happier days or his original love affair or whatever else happens. And then, then the horse drops dead and you hear the march music, which symbolizes victory in battle. That's about all you can do in music, and Liszt is very smart in limiting himself to the things that music can do and not making us crazy trying to illustrate the things that it cannot do. So Mazep is a lot of fun, and it exists in a bunch of versions because it's also, it's technically his symphonic poem number six of the 12, but it's also the, the transcendental etude for piano number four which is quite similar and uses the same themes, but it's, but it's expanded greatly in the orchestral version. It's a short piano piece originally. So if you like the orchestral version or the piano version, you can compare the two. And also not just hear you know, what music can express in terms of telling this story, but also how Liszt adapts it to these two different media, to the orchestra and to the solo piano. It's very interesting. Liszt is fascinating that way because he recycled things and worked on them and you know, made 50 versions of everything. So you can spend a lifetime just sort of following the same stories through his, through his career. So after Liszt, we're going to go to César Franck, the French composer. He wrote the fantastic tone poem. Oh my goodness, it's wonderful. It's called Le Chasseur Maudit, The Accursed Huntsman. Now, there's an interesting kind of convention in the English-speaking world. It's kind of weird, but I just need to tell you, is that French tone poems, we use the French title, what German ones we don't. German ones we translate, which is really kind of interesting because the German ones are actually a little bit closer to English etymologically than the French ones are, but go figure. So The Accursed Huntsman is a tone poem in, in four sections, and it tells this story absolutely fabulously well. It's a beautiful Sunday. People are going to church. The church bells are ringing. And, and you hear hunting horns. The, the nobleman, the local nobleman has decided to go hunting, even though it's Sunday and you're not supposed to. And he goes riding Russia. The hunt gets going and it's this great tune with horns blasting and galloping horses. You get horses again, like in Mazeppa, but they're different horses. And, you know, he tramples over things and he's, he doesn't care and he, he curses and does all kinds of blasphemous things. And so, and so all of a sudden the horns that are blowing around get stopped up. They're going, bah, 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 da, 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 and they're going, Meh. and there's silence and he's cursed. He's cursed because he's a blasphemer to, to wander the countryside hunting forever in death. <laughs> Get it? And so then we have the Accursed Hunt, which is spooky. It's a parody of the original hunt music made so as to be kind of ghostly and slithery. And, and that's how it ends. And it's wonderful. They go off into the distance, hunting to the alarming sound of the original church bells and pursued by demons and you know it's whatever you want to put into it it's just marvelous it's about 15 minutes long and the order of events could not possibly be more clear it's absolutely brilliant 
Next, a really famous one, Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. Now, Tchaikovsky called this an overture. He called it an overture, but it, it's as graphic as can be. And what's really brilliant about it is how Tchaikovsky has isolated the elements that make for perfect storytelling. It begins with the rather placid tune of Friar Lawrence. It's vaguely ecclesiastical and churchy sounding. And this introduction starts to get more and more anxious. And then it goes back and then it gets more anxious and it gets more anxious. It goes back and forth and back and forth through about the first five minutes or so. And then all of a sudden you have fight music, the fight between the Montagues and the Capulets. And that's very, very exciting. And the fight music subsides and then we get the tune. Yeah, da, 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 the love theme, which symbolizes Romeo and Juliet. Now, he doesn't have to follow every incident in the play to get the point across. The point is how the love theme gets destroyed and stomped on and crushed by the battle music. That's the deal, right? That's the story in a nutshell. It's how the, the fight between the two families, the feud eventually subsumes the love for Romeo and Juliet and results in their death. And the moment of death is really pretty, pretty graphic. I mean, it's, it's fabulous the way, you know, the love theme keeps trying to rise to a passionate climax, but the battle keeps coming back. And then finally with a big pow on the timpani, they're dead. And then there's a funeral march sort of finale which are, or ending which you know takes the love theme and, and presents it in a broken-hearted transformation um, and then uh, a big ending and that's Romeo and Juliet and it's long it's about 20 some odd minutes long it's it's a major major work um, but wow what a wonderful bit of storytelling that is totally focused on what the music can actually do you have lyricism versus turmoil. That's what it is. And on top of it all, you have Friar Lawrence trying to pacify everybody. Those are the three elements. And you just listen to how they get mixed up in the entire, in, in the overture, and, and that's the deal. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And of course, because it's Tchaikovsky, the tunes are just, ah, to die for. Gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. And we're going to stay in Russia for the next one. And you know this one, even if you don't know it. It's Mussorgsky's A Night on Bald Mountain, sometimes called A Night on the Bear Mountain. Now, this exists in multiple versions because Mussorgsky never really finished anything. He originally wrote it for an opera and he didn't finish the opera. And then after he died, his colleague Rimsky-Korsakov got a hold of it and tidied it up and arranged it for concert performance independently. And that's the version we usually hear. But you may also hear the original version, which is quite different in its organization and order of themes and in its basic sound orchestration, because Mussorgsky was self-taught. His orchestration wasn't all that polished, and so it kind of sounds raw and strange, which we like now, by the way. We think that's a good thing. And Rimsky-Korsakov is far more professional and polished, and some people say, well, that's a bad thing because it's, you know, it doesn't sound original. Well, I think it's a hundred times better than the original, but that's up for you to decide. Then, of course, there's the version that was in Fantasia, I mean, what is a night on Bald Mountain? Well, it's, it's a witch's Sabbath. You know, you've got demons and spooky things having some sort of infernal orgy. That's, that's what it is. There's no specific, you know, story of you know, what's happening moment by moment or blow by blow that would be terribly helpful when you're listening to it. And at the very end, the sun comes up and the spirits disperse and, and we have a lyrical, sweet, soft, gentle ending. But the version in Fantasia was arranged by the conductor, Leopold Stokowski. And his version um, is, is completely different from the other two in terms of how it ends, particularly. It's based on Rimsky-Korsakov's, but he gussies up the orchestration even more. So you don't know what version you're going to get. The best way to get it is just look at it and say, it'll say, A Night on Bald Mountain, Mussorgsky, ARR, arranged by Rimsky-Korsakov. And that's the normal one. That's the one you should hear first. And you know this music. It was, it was, a, it was the, the Dodge Ram pickup truck commercial, among other things. It's 
beyond famous. And it's just a thrilling piece of music. It really, really is. I mean, my goodness, it's fun. But there's, this is the case where you have a symphonic poem that doesn't tell a narrative. It's, it's not a straight line narrative like Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet or Mazeppa. It's simply two moods, the witch's Sabbath orgy mood and the post-sunrise resigned, regretful, suffused with light, gentle mood. That's it. And those are organized in a musically satisfying way. And that's what you get. But of course, you, you have to give it a title because when you listen to all of this craziness at the beginning and, and, and the, you know, you, you say to yourself, my God, what is that? It's got to be something. And so we know what the something is. But how it all turns out and what's happening in it, that's up to you. And that's what makes these things so much fun because you bring your own imagination to the act of listening. So after Mussorgsky, we have to do Richard Strauss, whose symphonic poems are called tone poems, um, whatever that difference makes. Now, now he wrote a whole slew of them, as did you know Liszt, and some of them are very famous. You know, the 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 two thousand and one Space Odyssey music is his tone poem Also Sprach Zarathustra, a philosophical tone poem after a philosophical book by Nietzsche but we're not talking about that one. We're going to do death and transfiguration. And there is a reason for that. It's because I always hated death and transfiguration. I thought it was just the stupidest piece of music ever until I actually sat down, until I played it, actually. I played it in our community orchestra, and, and oh my goodness, it's wonderful. <laughs> Turns out it's fabulous. But, you know, I, I just found the whole thing kind of off-putting. You know, death and transfiguration. Mm. You know, I mean, I just thought it was hokey. I really did. And it was part of a, a series of three tone poems that usually get coupled together on records. The first is Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks, which is extremely straight line, linear narrative, and Don Juan, which is also straight line, linear narrative. And then this one, Tod und Verklärung, in German, which is why we call it Death and Transfiguration in English. And, you know, they were always coupled together. And when they're all coupled together, you basically call them Till Dawn Death. And so we used to say, oh, I got a new recording of Till Dawn Death. Because they make, they all fit beautifully on a compact disc or an album or something. But Death and Transfiguration does exactly what it says it does. It portrays death and then the transfiguration of an as yet you know, non-specific, uh, non-doctrinaire, shall we say, you know, non-denominational afterlife. And oh my goodness, what a great afterlife it turns out to be. It's just beautiful. But the genius of this piece is, is its form. And that was the part I didn't get right away. I was just thinking of the title. The title just put me off. I thought it was silly to even try. And what's even worse is that it came attached with this enormous poem a horrible, stupid poem that one of Strauss's friends wrote to, you know, put in the score as a preface. And you don't want to read the poem because the music doesn't follow the poem at all. It doesn't have anything to do with the music. The music is, formally speaking, simply the emergence of a tune, the transfiguration tune. And it only gets played at the very end. But bits of it pop up along the way. And it's struggling to emerge, but it only emerges after the moment of death. And the moment of death is quite marvelous. You know, you, you, it's, a, it's like a soap bubble popping. You hear the soul escaping the body just goes like that. And then there's a little, a little one of these on the tam-tam, you know, it goes. That's the moment, the big moment of death. And then that, that thing has like 20 shots. That's what I played. I played the tam-tam part. And then gradually the big tune emerges in all of its all of its radiance just once. And it's gloriously orchestrated and really fun. And along the way, I mean, the experience of dying isn't just like, uh, you know, it's not like that. It starts with sort of a faltering heartbeat, but you have scenes of turmoil and you have happy memories of youth and love and, and more turmoil and then, then the transfiguration bit starts to come out. I mean, the guy doesn't die easily. It's very dramatic and stormy. And then finally, you know, it transfigures and it really is wonderful. But think about it in those terms. Think about it as a tune that is seeking to emerge and you will hear it 
gradually pop out along the way. And it's marvelous. The tune is do 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 wada. It's that fabulous what we call octave displacement. The actual tune is do 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 do. It sounds so boring, but when you jump up an octave for the last two notes, do 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 yada, all of a sudden it becomes just like this yearning, searching, transfigurational thing, and it's only because Strauss jumped up an octave for those last two notes. It's just there's all kinds of wonderful musical details of this piece that are fun to listen to. So it's and it's about 25 minutes long too. It's a long work, big work. But you're going to have a great time with it. And I'm, the reason I want it in this, this particular list is because I'm saving you the problem of having to learn how to like it after dismissing it as a piece of junk initially. It's not. It really isn't. It's just marvelous. So after that, oh yeah, let's do some Dvorak, shall we? The Water Goblin. Now this is serious narrative. Dvorak took a series of Czech folk poems which describe really horrific events. I mean, folk poetry is usually pretty gory and strange. And he turned them into symphonic poems that don't just follow the story, but the actual melodies follow the rhythms of the Czech language, which of course we don't know and don't care about. And we, all we have to know is that the tunes are great and they sound very vocal. They really do. I mean, the, the water goblin is bum 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 Bum, 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 bum. I mean, it, it sounds poetic. It sounds like it rhymes musically. It's really fascinating stuff. But in the Water Goblin, well, the Water Goblin is, is, is just marvelous. A woman is, is, and her daughter, they live together in a little house, and she says, I'm going to go out to the river and do the laundry. And the mother says, no, don't go. The Water Goblin's swimming around. You don't want to be out there. She says, ah, oh, it's a beautiful day. What's the, day? It's, what's the problem? So she goes out on the bridge and starts doing her laundry. And sure enough, the Water Goblin turns up and, and, and collapses the bridge and drags her down to his watery realm, where he ravishes her. And she gives birth to a little baby goblin and she's very lonely because she can't see her mother and she has her little baby which she likes but the water goblin's jealous because she likes the baby and she begs him to go home and visit her mother with her baby goblin and the water goblin says okay but you better be back when the bell rings the you know noon bell or whatever it is so she goes back to see her mother and they have a conversation and they're chatting and the mother refuses to let her go back and a storm brews up and the bell rings and she's not back and the water goblin is furious furious because she's left the baby he's insisted that she leave the baby behind as sort of you know a ransom for her to come back but she doesn't go back so he kills the baby and flings it on the doorstep and that's the story very very gruesome and there are four of these folk poems there's the water goblin there's the noonday witch there's the golden spinning wheel and the wood dove and they're all equally grisly but the music is fantastic it's like our talk, discussion of opera, you know, of Salome and things like that, that music can describe absolutely horrific events, but it can do it in such a beautiful and powerful and compelling way that we, you know, we, just, we just say, oh, that was nice. <laughs> that was lovely. And, you know, there you go. And it is. It's fantastic. The music is exciting as hell and the tunes are amazing. So uh, Dvorak's tone poems have only really become popular in the past couple of decades. Most people didn't know that he even wrote them because he was so well known as a symphonist, as one of the Brahms faction of, you know, more conservative symphonic composers and chamber music and whatnot, abstract music. But the truth of the matter is he straddled. He did both and he did both equally well. He wrote fabulous operas and he wrote these symphonic poems and they're absolutely splendid. So give the water goblin a shot. You'll maybe lose a little sleep over it, but you'll be glad you did. Oh yeah. Number, number, what are we up? Number eight, Duca. Paul Ducat, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, another tone poem that was featured in Fantasia, the most famous of all from Fantasia, right? Mickey Mouse is the Sorcerer's Apprentice enchanting the broom to fill up the, the, you know, that basin with water and he can't make it stop and the flood comes and that's the story. We know the story very well and this is such a brilliant piece. My goodness, talk about a piece of music that tells the story so vividly. You hear you hear the bored apprentice, you know, in the sorcerer's sorcerer's, you know, studio or den or whatever it is, and then his magic spell, da da dum, da da dum, 
the magic spell, then the, the, the bassoon, the bassoon is the broom. Boom, boom. That becomes bigger and crazier. Then he chops it up. Then all the pieces come to life and become dozens of brooms. And I mean, it's all in there. It's so graphic. It's so wonderfully clear that the sorcerer comes back with the incantation at the very end of the climax and, and you know, puts everything to right and then gives the apprentice a kick in the butt for messing things up. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of music anybody ever wrote. It's very difficult to play. It's rhythmically very, very tricky. It's about 10 minutes long. It's just just scads of fun. And it, again, you know, you may know it, you may know the tunes, but, but if you really sit down and listen to it and focus on it, just how wonderful it is, it's, it's a whole different world when you pay attention. Not just like know it and then say, okay, that's what it is. But you really listen to it and hear all the detail, all the love that's built into it. Especially by a composer like Tuka, who only wrote a dozen pieces of music and destroyed everything else that he wrote. He wrote one symphony, one overture, one symphonic poem, one ballet, one piano sonata. He basically left one of, one of everything that he, that he tackled. And, and that was it. He was that self-critical. And, you know... I mean, this is, this is a huge masterpiece, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. It really is. And you can watch it on Fantasia as well because it follows. They play the whole thing straight, as they do not, by the way, with A Night on Bald Mountain or some of these other pieces. This is the entire work, start to finish, perfectly, perfectly done. It's one of the great realizations of a piece of music for the big screen that you've, you'll ever see. It's absolutely wonderful. Next... Sibelius, the great Finnish composer, he was a big tone poem guy. And, and I just, we talked about, for short orchestral works, we talked about Finlandia. But his, one of his really greatest tone poems is called Pohjola's Daughter. Now, Pohjola is not a person, it's a place. In, in, in Finnish, the, the suffix la means place of. Like, for example, Sibelius had a house called Ainola. His wife's name was Aino. And so the house is Ainola, the place where Aino is. And his last symphonic poem was called Tapiola. Tapio is the forest god. So Tapiola is the dwelling of the forest god. So Pohyola's daughter is the daughter of the Northland. That's what it means. She is, she is a, a sorceress, a spirit being. And this tone poem tells the story of Vainamoinen, who's a sort of heroic slash comical character who wants to make nookie with the maiden of the north she's sitting there spinning her magic spinning thing and and he he she says well okay but you have to do several impossible tasks one of which involves him you know accidentally chopping off his own foot and so he gets wounded and he's very annoyed and he's a magician too so he doesn't like die or anything and he gets on this sled and he runs away because it's not worth the trouble and this is a fantastic piece of music to also illustrate what music can and can't do. Technically, there are three tasks that he, she gives him, but the music only has room for two of them. Um, and it begins with storytelling around a fire, some sort of ritual tale, bards talking about, you know, folklore of old. I mean, none of this is written down. You just get the sense of it because it's so atmospheric. And then you the music gradually speeds up until you you feel the spinning wheel. You, 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 she's sitting there spinning, and then this guy shows up. He's on the brass, and he has this big proclamation, here I am, aha, aren't I cool, don't you want me, dear? And she's just laughing at him. And the laughing, I mean, you, you, well, sometimes it's laughter. Sometimes it might be howls of pain when you wax his foot off. You have to figure it out. But there are two big episodes in the middle, and then he goes whipping away. It's, it's just unbelievably brilliant, about 12 minutes long in this case, and it's, it's just sheer, sheer genius in storytelling because it makes you feel that the story is being told. But what exactly is happening? What tasks does she assign to him? Music can't tell us that. There's no way. I mean, he has to, like, you know, make a something out of an egg or do a boat with a thing. I, I Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it, it can't be that specific. But you do get the sense of things happening, of things going wrong, of laughter, of pain, of, of 
you know, frustration of all of these things and, you know, the spinning wheel going around. I mean, it's all in there. But how you sort it out is, again, it's up to you to use your imagination. You bring your own vision to bear on what's happening in the music. However, we're going to conclude with another fabulous French tone poem, one of the most famous of all, Debussy's La Mer, The Sea. See, now here's another one. No one says, oh, I'm going to listen to Debussy's The Sea. Everyone calls it La Mer, just like we call Franck's Le Chasseur Maudit. We, we call it by the French name, and, and Strauss's Tot und Verklärung we call Death and Transfiguration. Don't ask me why. Now, La Mer is in three movements, three separate movements, from dawn till noon on the sea, the play of the waves, and the dialogue between the wind and the sea. And it is actually very symphonic. In other words, it has themes that appear. I mean, themes from the first movement pop up again in the last movement. It's very well unified and integrated, but it is a symphonic poem. And it is the classic symphonic evocation of water, of the ocean. I could do an entire list of nothing but water, symphonic poems about water, the sea, the ocean. Lots of composers did them. Ravel did Un Barque sur le Océan, you know, a boat on the, in the ocean. Sibelius did the Oceanides, the sea spirits. I mean, the ocean is a big, big topic for musical illustration. And La Mer is the classic version of it. There are several other seas. I mean, Glazunov, the Russian composer, he did the sea. Frank Bridge, the British composer, he did the sea. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So you can compare all of these things if you want, once you like it. If you know you want to hear the ocean, you can get five or six ocean symphonic poems and, and see, what, see what they, uh, how they turn out and which ones you like best. But La Mer is, is, is the one that you got to know. It's the one you start with. It's the water music to end all water musics, and it is fabulously watery and brilliant and full of wonderful tunes and fuzzy impressionist. You know, Debussy was supposed to be impressionist, which means kind of, you know, fuzzy, like, you know, Monet's water lilies, you know, so there's some of that. But there's also an awful lot of pointillistic clarity to the music as well. It's about 20, 25 minutes long and three movements, and it's just you know, one of those shattering masterpieces that everyone acknowledges and that, and that you're going to love on first hearing. It's so much fun to listen to. It's absolutely wonderful. It ends with a huge wave, big, huge wave, psh, crash. It's marvelous. So those are our 10 tone poems or symphonic poems or concert overtures or whatever they are. They're pieces of program music, music that tells us something external to the process of merely expressing the emotions of an abstract work like a symphony or a quartet or something like that. Um, but like I said, these, these distinctions are not hard and firm. They are very fuzzy. And so you don't need to worry about definitions. What you need to do is simply listen and enjoy what the music is expressing with or without the external explanation. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.